I'm Brian Briscoe, host of the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast, and this podcast is different than everything else out there. I bring together a new and an experienced investor on each episode, and I let the aspiring investor ask the questions that they need answered. So if you're an aspiring investor yourself, you probably will have the exact same questions. Now, before we get to this episode, make sure you hit the subscribe button below and that little bell to make sure you get notified every time we post a new episode. And now, enjoy the show. When you have a deal and you have investors that you are going to bring onto the deal, how, I guess, how does that work in that? Do you bring, do you have those, that, those funds lined up before you have it on the deal under contract or do you bring that in after? You know, first syndication was, um, I had the deal and then I tried to raise funds and I never want to go through that mm-hmm. experience again, um, of, okay. of delaying closes and Hey, you told me you were going to do this. Why are this? Hey buddy, why are this money now? <laughs> Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe, and coming to you with another Ask the Expert episode today. I'm very excited for this one. I think it's going to be an amazing conversation. Um, We got our experienced investor, Mike Stoller, and aspiring investor, Alex Kingman. So, um, Mike, as is tradition, you're up first. uh, Bring on the experience today. So, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure have, having uh, me on, and I'm looking forward to just talking about uh, what we do and what we've done and how we've done it. Awesome. Awesome. And I very, very much am anxious to get going. So uh, do us a favor and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I uh, started way back. I'm from a small town in Indiana, mm-hmm. and we were talking earlier. I come from the PG days yeah. prior to internet, pre Google. Pre Google. So we didn't have this type of thing. So, but I knew that real estate was it. I mm-hmm. went to Barnes and Noble, got rich dad, poor dad, and was hooked. And I'm sure 90 some percent of your listeners know that book. Yep. I knew that was it. And what I did was I went out and immediately started buying some real estate. Mm-hmm. But what rich dad, poor dad didn't tell me is how to become a landlord. Mm-hmm. You know, buying was, you know, go out and buy. I'm like, okay, yep. yes, sir. Easy. I went out and bought easy. That's the easy part. Yep. Five day notices. How do you know, I, you have to put ads in the newspaper to get 10, you know, it's mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff I did, you know, and I, I failed miserably when I first got involved. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really has taught me. Yeah. Um, these are things you didn't do right. And these are things. And, but what I did was like, how can I learn? Yeah. So I actually went and got a job as a property manager mm-hmm. through a big company. So it's like, okay, now I can learn this side of it, how to do it. And fast forward, um, little Jean as an airline pilot. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we've owned, managed, I uh, think, 13 to 1400 apartment units. Mm-hmm. And now we're uh, into the hotel space. We're diversifying and, and syndicating and buying hotels. So we're kind of yeah. having fun with those. Yeah. So um, now when, when did you start uh, moving towards the hotel space? Pro, uh, about six years ago. Mm-hmm. And the, the reason why I, I did it was started going off in my head. I was getting some offers mm-hmm. off market offers on some of our apartment complexes mm-hmm. that were just insane amounts of money and these are just out of state people and i'm just like mm-hmm. oh my gosh you know it's like yeah. i'd be a fool not to take it but you know, i'm here in arizona where everything's just you know very mm-hmm. condensed uh, as far as cap rates and things like that so i was like yeah mm-hmm. do i want to buy something right now at a three and a half mm-hmm. Um, so I've made the switch to hotels, yeah. which are not yeah. very many people are in. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, you know, especially after COVID, I think a lot more people jumped into hotels because there was almost a fire sale, you know, with, yeah. with the COVID shutdowns and clamp down on travel, both, both domestically and internationally, there just weren't 
weren't a lot of hotels that were able to, to, you know, keep paying their bills. So um, just, just curious. I mean, you said you came in six years ago into the hotel space. Mm -hmm. How did, how did your port, your hotel portfolio fare during, during COVID? Luckily mm -hmm. they, uh, they did. Okay. All of them were able to stay open. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the biggest differences between hotels and multi multifamily is hotels are what's considered a business. Mm -hmm. So I was able to get the EIDL mm. loans. I was able to get the PPP loans. Mm -hmm. We're considered, you know, small businesses. I was able to get all the grants and all the help from the government and cities and states. Mm -hmm. So that really helped us. And then thank God, um, and this, this isn't meant to be political, but um, as a business owner, you have to kind of think, think these things through. Mm -hmm. All of our hotels are in states that didn't shut down. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I would have never thought about that with, you know, rent moratoriums or with, you know, uh, businesses shutting down. I'd never thought about that pre-COVID, but mm -hmm. our strategies have actually shifted. You know, if you thought as an investor, how can I get through COVID and how can I become a better general partner mm -hmm. uh, syndicator after COVID? You have to really think about, wow, some of these things I have to be now more careful about where I buy assets. Yeah. Yeah. And I, for a lot of multifamily people, they talk about, you know, the landlord friendly states versus the tenant friendly mm -hmm. states and, you know, to, to pull the political thing in and I don't just want to brush on it for the most part, it's red state, blue states. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are a couple of, you know, maybe the swing states that can go either way, but for the most part, Red states are landlord friendly. Blue states are are more tenant friendly, and you know I, I can yeah. see exactly how that that helps with with the hotels because most of the you know landlord friendly states didn't shut down because of COVID, and therefore people who own hotels were still getting people who were able to travel. So you know what's crazy is uh, one of our hotels in Arizona. Mm -hmm. You know, California was completely closed. Yep. Um, you couldn't even go outside and do sports. Mm -hmm. They stopped everything. And I would have two travel teams that were four miles apart from each other in San Diego, mm -hmm. travel all the way to Arizona just to play each other. <laughs> and, yep. you know, that's for probably the first time in my life. I was like, oh, thank you, California, for yeah. shutting yeah. down because we got business. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's actually a good point that I, I wouldn't have thought about with hotels either is, you know, if, if there's something like that, I mean, who, who throws an epidemic or a pandemic, or I, I don't even know what the difference is to be honest with you and into your underwriting, you know, I mean, who, who says, Hmm, I think during 2020 and 2021, we're going to have this big thing that, uh, you know, I don't know what they're going to call it, but it's going to shut down the entire economy for a couple months. But yeah. I'm glad you were able to make it through that. And, uh, um, Sounds pretty, pretty cool. So let's uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about one of the deals you've done. You know, pick your first, your favorite, your most recent, and give us give us a little more details mm -hmm. on on one of these deals. Uh, like syndications. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Syndications. I mean, if if you've done other types of, mm -hmm. of purchases, it's fine too. But uh, yeah. Well, um, what a, an interesting one is is some of your listeners and Alex. I don't know if you'll know the difference between this between like a JV agreements and syndications, mm -hmm. um, and a joint ventures. Let's say your partner that's going to come and help you. They're going to be actively involved. Yep. Syndications are they're limited partners. Mm -hmm. So, in order to and this is for people that maybe are in fix and flips. They do single family homes. And you want to get into multifamily as far as maybe the big ones. And you really don't know a lot how to do it. When I first got into, let's say, hotels, I was like, I don't know anything about hotels. I don't know. I've, you know, I've owned 13, 1400 keys, doors. I'm used to keys now, uh, doors and multifamily. How do I break into hotels? Well, what I did is I found someone mm -hmm. that had 20 years experience. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is let's. I said, find me a hotel because I now have all this 1031 money mm -hmm. and I want you to operate it for me. Mm -hmm. And you're going to teach me everything, you know, and I will give you a cut mm -hmm. of ownership uh, for doing this for me, for being my mentor, for doing this. So we created a joint venture where 
he's active, I'm active, mm -hmm. but now I'm getting, it's, it's works for both sides. Now I'm getting all this experience mm -hmm. and now that's fast forward. And, and, you know, now we have several hotels. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that that's something that works extremely well, you know, partnering with somebody who can mentor you at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. obviously you, you know, if you're on the less experienced side, you got to find a way to add value. And in your case, it was, I've got 1031 money that I can bring to the table, which it adds an incredible amount of value. So I think that's a, that's a great way of, of learning the business, you know, latching onto somebody who's got that experience, bringing some sort of value and then learning by doing with in, in a much safer way, you know, yeah, don't more. just jump into it. Yeah. You know, I learned that at the very beginning, just don't, don't, just jump in and figure it out. Um, yeah. And that's, that's something that, uh, you know, jumping in and figuring it out. Um, you know, a lot of people are guilty of, I, I think I'm guilty of that as well. Um, and, and we've made a lot of, we made a lot of mistakes and fortunately, you know, we've, we've done okay, but, uh, um, I, I think the better model is to find somebody experienced that you can latch on to and yeah. provide some value and JV that way. So, yeah. um, so let's talk about, you know, your, your motivation here. So what's, mm -hmm. what's your big burning? Why? That's yeah, a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, when I was young, mm -hmm. in the, in the time far, far away. Yeah. Yeah. Stone age, uh, right? Stone I mean, age. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the motivation was, I see all these big houses and I see all these things and I see all these cool cars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the young person talking. Yeah. Um, as you get older, then the things that real estate has allowed me to do is just so much beyond the money will come. Yeah. If you have the mentorship and if you do the business coaching, uh, you know, I, I'm very successful and I still have coaches. I still have mentors and they're mm -hmm. just so important. But for me, it is now, and, and I actually have it in my office and it's, it's on this wall right behind me. It says build a life. You don't need a vacation from. I like and that. that is me. That is, I can take an RV. Mm -hmm. I can go anywhere in the world. I can go on vacations. I can do whatever it is, take the dogs with me and still work. And I never mind coming, going to work. I love that. I love that. Take, have a life that you don't need to take a vacation from. Right. I think, I think a lot of people, I mean, I, I definitely was in that trap for a while where, you know, you get so busy, you're so busy. It's like, I need a vacation. I need a break. Mm -hmm. I need to get out of it. You know, and if you can, if you can intentionally build your life, which is, um, I, I just joined um, a mastermind, you know, recently, and we're, we're looking at the, the whole life millionaire concept and doing exactly that. Build your life, be, be very deliberate about it and not just let the life happen. And uh, I appreciate you saying that because that, that helps me to, you kind of solidify things that I'm trying to do right now, mm -hmm. but uh, well, appreciate that very much. Um, so really, really good stuff going on that you've done so far. And, you know, the, the apartments and the, the hotels that have a lot of, I know there, there's a lot of overlaps, but what would you say would be the biggest difference between, you know, multifamily and, and the hotel space? Yeah, it's a great question. The biggest things it revolves around the business aspect. I have 15 to 20 employees or more mm -hmm. per location. So it's, I am now a business owner. Yeah. I'm not just a real estate owner. You know, the hotels, you have a business that sits on the real estate. So mm -hmm. when, you, when you're looking at loans and when you're looking at uh, the IRS, when you look at the entire big picture, hotels are actually considered a business. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd like though about the hotels is that I can change my you know, I'm using air quotes, rent mm -hmm. every day instead of six month yeah. leases, 12 month leases. For instance, uh, spring training's coming in, mm -hmm. bam, you know, I'm a hundred dollars more a night. Yep. Um, summer comes along, bam, I go in. So I can fluctuate. Mm -hmm. It's like gas prices. I can fly. I sometimes fluctuate four times a day. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows us to have an ADR, which is our average daily rate. Mm -hmm per however keys or rooms uh, where we get more money than yep. like with apartments because you're tied into a thousand dollar you know lease for 12 months or something mm -hmm. um, yeah. so th those are the biggest things 
Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And uh, um, I, I was living in uh, a very hot spot for vacations, Rio in, in Brazil at one point. And, you know, I, I know the hotels there during Carnival mm -hmm. were $1,500 a night. You know, it's just one of those things where, you know, we, we were seeing what was going on and people who wanted to come and visit during that time were like, wow, it's crazy. But I mean, it makes it makes a lot of sense because, you know, that there's there's a supply and demand and and it's something that you don't see with um, with multifamily is the the really big peak times for for these short term stuff. You can jack up your prices and get it. And it's it's a supply and demand all over again. So I, I like that aspect. I like that. I'm going to have to have to start looking into that. So. <laughs> Um, so that, that said, what's next for you? We're doing some with, with multifamily, we're waiting a bit mm -hmm. to see what the market brings as far as, um, cap rates and interest rates, mm -hmm. how they're, how they're fluctuating. So we're kind of on a, a wait to see before we do anything there. Um, what we're doing is we're going to do two ground up builds, mm -hmm. uh, in the hotel space here in Arizona. Okay. Uh, one is going to be a flip, um, uh, which is very unique in the hotel space. But there's uh, uh, really quick the in, the institutional people mm -hmm. only buy uh, hotels that are open because they're looking for an interest. They're looking for rates of return. Yeah. So they don't shareholders don't want to wait two years for it to come in. So they're looking for people like us that have come in. will buy. Well ground up, we'll build it, and then we'll market it during the build, and then they'll come in and mm -hmm. buy it. Um, and then the other one's going to be a mixed-use hotel. Okay. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's an interesting concept. I mean, um, I, I know there's a lot of multifamily developers that, you know, develop, will do a quick lease up, and mm -hmm. then, you know, once, once the lease up period is over, they'll, they'll sell it. And that's usually where they get the, the, the highest returns. Um, is it similar in the hotel space? I mean, there, I guess there wouldn't have to be a lease up period as soon as you're mm -hmm. operational. Yeah, correct. Because the, the people that are buying it, they'll have their own management team. It's location. It's the franchise, which flag. Mm -hmm. um, some are just better than others. But you don't really have to have a lease up because of you're just building in areas of future growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice, nice. Now, I, I do have to ask and for for people who are who are watching this on YouTube and not listening on the podcast. You've got some really pretty guitars behind you. <laughs> so, um, you know, first of all, I very very much admire it. I, I do want to have a Gibson Les Paul myself one of these days. It's on my uh, to buy list here this year, but. Uh, um, Tell, tell us a little bit, a bit about uh, the guitars and, uh, you know, how long you've been playing and, and what you do with it. Sure. Yeah, I've been off and on. Mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those as I'll, I'll play for six or eight months and I've been playing for, I don't know, 15 years or so. But you'll play mm -hmm. and then a project will come up. Right. And then yeah. <laughs> done. You know, you're done for a long time and then the project's over and then you have to relearn. You know, so I've been doing that that cycle. Um but I like to play rock and roll. So mm -hmm. the uh, 80s rock, 70s rock. So the blue one is what's called a Schechter. Mm -hmm. And that is the old 80s hairband metal. Mm -hmm. Just slash it out. Um, the, far, the red one is a Fender. Mm -hmm. That's more of the Eric Clapton type cool tones. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to play those. And then you've got my baby which is the custom Les Paul. Yeah. And uh, that's the uh, 60s style. And that's just, you know, some of the greatest rock and roll legends that's ever lived mm -hmm. all played the Les Paul. So yeah. it just has that unique, wonderful sound. You know, we're talking, you know, from Zeppelin to Slash on Guns N' Roses. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, they've all played Angus Young. They all played the Les Paul. Yeah. I think it's the prettiest guitar out there. And I, I, I fiddle around pun intended fiddle around with guitars, but, uh, um, you know, eventually I want to get really good at it, but uh, that's, that's, uh, you know, now that I got so much more time on my hands, that's something I'm going to be doing here soon. But anyway, appreciate very much talking about Absolutely. that for a second, but, uh, um, that said, we're going to shift gears and Alex has been waiting patiently. So Alex, welcome. 
Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. And I'm, we were kind of talking about it before, but yeah. I'm just really thankful that podcasts like this exist and that you guys who have been in the industry for a really long time can share your knowledge and expertise with newer people to the industry and help everyone learn and get better. So yeah. I'm really excited. Well, I, I have fun doing it. And, you know, most people who come on to the, sh to, to the podcast in, in Mike's position do it for the same reason. They're like, yeah, I want to help someone out. So mm -hmm. um, somebody that I, I really respect in this community once said, and I really appreciate the analogy is you need to go through life with one hand up and one hand down, you know, and that the hand up is somebody who's helping you, your, your mentor, so to speak. And the hand down is, is, is to bring somebody else up with you. But yeah. um, I love that mentality, but uh, I like thanks. that. <laughs> thanks for saying <laughs> I haven't so. heard that. Yeah. Anyway, Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Yeah. So I, I'm in the real estate industry mm -hmm. and I currently uh, invest with my partner who isn't here with me today, but uh, basically we have a company where we invest in uh, properties, um, you know, one to 50 units right now. And we work with partners and we're working up to the place where we can do syndications and, you know, larger size deals, but we work with partners and we buy properties out of state. I'm from California, yeah. so we don't buy here. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we buy out of state and then usually they need work. So we'll do mm -hmm. whatever value add we need to do to it, whether that's uh, up until this point, it's mainly just been rehabbing uh, the property itself needed work and then rent it out and mm -hmm. do the refinance and then go from there and keep it for the uh, long term for the cash flow. So yeah. up until this point, that's what we've been doing. I'm, mm -hmm. I do this full time and it, it is really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy doing it. So um, yeah, other than that, before real estate, I was doing a lot in the business realm, mm -hmm. kind of like you guys were mentioning before. I read a book by Robert, Robert Kiyosaki in yeah. middle school. I happened mm -hmm. to pick it up for a spring break. <laughs> I don't know what about it intrigued me, but it was like one of the first nonfiction books I had read yeah. and just loved it. And it totally changed my life and the trajectory of my life. And I just realized like, this is where I want to go with my life. I want to be an investor and a, a mm -hmm. business owner and do all of that. So up until I started doing real estate, I focused on starting and running different uh, small businesses. And then also I would go and like Robert Kiyosaki had said, I really took it to heart, work mm -hmm. to learn, not necessarily to earn. So yeah. I, um, Kind of like you were saying, Mike, how you worked in property management to learn property management. Mm -hmm. I worked in a couple different areas of business to learn those areas. Mm -hmm. And then once I got to real estate, into real estate, I kind of had everything pretty solid in the, in the experience, yeah. um, in the areas that I needed. Yeah. So up until that point, you know, um, you know, marketing, sales, bookkeeping, mm -hmm worked for a financial advisor for a while. So mm -hmm. just different things like that. And it was just really exciting and interesting. Yeah. yeah if, I, if I had a reset button, you know, and I, I, I read Robert Kiyosaki when I was mid twenties, I wish it was, uh, um, I wish it was a lot earlier, but uh, if I had a reset button, I think I would have, you know, been a little more bold as far as the working to learn, you know, because mm. um, I remember reading that book and think, man, I mean, I had two kids at the time and it was just like, do I really want to chance it? You know, and, and the answer for me was no, I don't want to chance it. And so I, I went with the work to earn instead of the work to learn. But uh, I think I would have been so much better off, you know, now had I had I followed that Robert Kiyosaki model to the T. But uh, um, yeah, well, it, such is life, right? But uh, <laughs> um, glad, glad you picked that up a lot earlier and, and we're actually mm -hmm. able to, to do it. So, um, so Next question, and one of my favorites to always ask, what's your motivation? What's your big burning why? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And like Mike said with that, with the quote about uh, live, uh, build a life that you don't need a vacation from, mm -hmm. I totally resonated with that. That's a lot of my why as well. So mm -hmm. 
kind of on the same wavelength there, Mike. But yeah. also uh, to add on that, I would really like the financial freedom to be able to live life on my own terms. Mm -hmm. And my partner and I would really like to spend more time with our daughter and be able to just have the flexibility in our day to do whatever we would like. We both enjoy going to jujitsu. And so being able to do that kind of during the day or whenever, and just being able to do anything that we want is really important to me and to my partner. And so we are trying to build that, build wealth, and then teach that to our daughter. And as we continue to grow from there, then we can give back to everyone as we go. So I, that's my why. Yeah, I love it. And, and I mean, you mentioned it again, but Mike, I think I'm going to write that on the whiteboard, you know, right across, <laughs> from, you know, live a life that you don't need to take a vacation from. So yeah. Um, I'm, I'm inspired by that. So anyway, so now I, I've got a lot of favorites, you know, favorite questions, but this is my favorite part of every episode. Um, Alex, we got Mike on the line. What do you want to ask him? Great. Yes. I definitely have some questions for you, Mike. <laughs> so the first question that I have for you, you touched on a little bit earlier when you were talking about the difference between JV and syndications. Mm -hmm. And my up to up until this point, my partner and I have only operated on smaller deals, um, you know, one to four units. So we are currently looking for larger deals and moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Up until this point, we've only needed to do JVs or partnerships or things like that. But when when does it become a necessity to structure your deal as a syndication? Mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. a partnership or something else like that? Yeah, that's well, a great question, Alex. So with JVs and partnerships, that's what it is. It's a partner. All of you have a role in the business. Mm -hmm. When you start getting big enough and, you know, we get into maybe 50 units or 100 units, and we're talking uh, multiple millions of dollars, and you have the experience mm -hmm. now to run those. Now what you're doing is you're not looking for partners to help you run the business. You just need limited partners. Those are just, you just need the cash. You just need to raise, you know, $2 million, but you don't necessarily want them to be a part of it. And most of those people, most of my investors don't want to be a part of it. They're just diversifying their portfolio. Right. Okay, they have their stocks, their bonds, their four hundred one ks. Now they're going to give me three, five hundred thousand, or whatever, and just say, "Go make ten percent, or go make eight percent, whatever it is." Mm -hmm. um, so, when you get to that point where number one, the price tag starts going up, and you need to raise millions instead of just a hundred thousand, and you know you can. With friends and family, you can do that most of the time, just raise those. But um, so that's when, you know, it's when you get to that point where you're just raising enough money that you need enough money that you need to either branch your network out or, you know, depending on what type of syndication you do, uh, start advertising for money because the, the right. amount that you need to raise is, is a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. And I've been asking this question to a few different people. So it's always interesting to just hear all the different um, answers. So the next question that I have is, what is your typical process of bringing a new potential investor into your sphere of, or circle? And mm -hmm. kind of what is your process from that point until, let's say, a deal is funded or until there are funds being transferred, I guess. What is your process with, with potential investors and how do you go about doing that? Um, okay, so in finding potential investors first, you know, that's kind of like a, a big part. Um, and you'll get there sooner or later. Yet I have my own podcast. Mm -hmm. I am on podcasts like, like Brian's and, and several others that I do a couple times a week. So people just get to know me. I also... Mm -hmm. Uh, the biggest thing for you right now will be just networking. 
the local RIAs, uh, investing groups, Facebook groups, just your circle of friends. You need that your influence and your sphere of, of friends to be um, that type of person, you know, that you can do syndications. Um, and even maybe at the beginning, you can do JVs with the RIA people, people that want to also get into it. And that's how you can afford to buy something bigger is you all go in and learn together and do it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I golf also. So, you know, a lot of my investors come from the golf course. Uh, I'm also part of uh, um, social groups, you know, like uh, uh, Rotary. You know, I, I just, I'm involved in all these different things. And people say, you know, Mike, it's Tuesday during the day. Why, you know, are you retired? You're, why are you golfing? Yeah. You know, so it's like, ah, you know, let me tell you what I do. Those types of things. Now, once someone is interested, I just through my syndications and through my other things, I have uh, portals and I have a website. So mm -hmm. if people are interested, you know, they go to my website and say, hey, you know, want to be an investor, click, goes through the form and then puts them into a database on my portal. Um, so that's how I do it. And then I do um, monthly updates. I'm always doing things, you know, this is, especially during COVID, this is how apartments are doing. This is how hotels are doing. And I'm just kind of always keeping them engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we're seeing, like a forecasting, all the experts and, and all these types of things. So that kind of keeps them engaged. Mm -hmm. And then when I have a new, offering i'll just kind of start mm -hmm. one one newsletter say hey you know this is coming up this might come up just kind of like this little breadcrumb trail and then um then we do the offering mm -hmm. that's the last part kind of like the prime in the pump yeah and prime in the pump <laughs> yeah i mean our, our process is very similar you know um i don't golf and that's something that i'm starting to think maybe i should start golfing right but uh um <laughs> Very, very similar process. You know, you figure out how to get yourself in front of more and more people mm -hmm. who are um, interested in investing, you know, and wh whatever that is for you, you just got to figure it out. You know, what's your what's your target investor look like and how do you get in front of that person? You know, build a relationship, you know, and keep that relationship alive. And Mike was talking about how, how he did that specifically, but build the relationship, maintain the relationship. And then when you have an offering, um, I like also what he said, where you, you you send out, you know, the, hey, this might be coming later, you know, and then you start priming the pump for the investment. So it's not a, here's the investment, invest now. It's a one week, it's like, hey, coming soon. And the next week, it's the, um, hey, announcing, you know, this property. And then the next week, you're sending the pitch deck. And the next week, you're getting on the webinar. But that's, that yeah. seems to work extremely well for us. That is a lot of really good information. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're recording this. So, you know, you can just, you know, re-listen to it. Over, over, over. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely, uh, there are a lot of things in there that I can see I could definitely start doing and that's mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them I do already, so I feel good about that. I'm on the right track there, but mm -hmm. definitely, definitely excited to, to incorporate some of those other ones. Nice. Um, I have another question for you, Mike. <laughs> when you get a, when you find, when you have a deal mm -hmm. and you have investors that you are going to bring onto the deal um, and all invest together, um, how I guess how does that work? In that, do you? bring do you have those that those funds lined up before you have it on the deal under contract or do you bring that in after or how does that part work <laughs> when that's a great, you, yeah it's, yeah, it's a great ahead. question and i've done it, <laughs> it all different ways um you know first syndication was um i had the deal and then i tried to raise funds and I never want to go through that mm -hmm. experience again um, of, okay. of delaying closes and, hey, you told me you were going to do this. Why are this? Hey, buddy, why are this money now? Mm -hmm. 
And then it's just the stress of going through the clothes and all the inspections and all this stuff, and then trying to track down the money that was mm-hmm. promised mm-hmm. Uh, can get extremely, uh, it's just, I had hair prior to that. <laughs> that <sounds> stressful. <laughs> it's very stressful. Um, what we like to do is, and you can do it other ways, you know, there are instead mm-hmm. of syndications, you can do a fund. The investor is going to have to really trust you. Mm-hmm. If, if you say that, hey, I want to raise $2 million and I'm going to buy a multifamily in this area, but I don't know what it is yet. That also has its challenges Mm -hmm. Um, because they're like going, well, who are you and how many of these things have have you done? Mm -hmm. Um, But what I like to do is if I have a specific one in mind uh, in an area, then I'm going to say, in this city, we're going after one of these, one of these two, and it could be one that's coming up for auction. It could be one that's coming for sale. Um, and then I get, I start getting the funds immediately um, through the pitch deck of saying, it's going to be maybe one of these two things I'm going to do. Um, in hotels, it's a, it's a lot longer close. So it's okay. a little bit easier. Um, to raise the funds the ground up ones were oh, that's kind of I, I think the easiest because mm-hmm. I don't have to close you know it's you know I don't have the seller that uh, mm-hmm. is, is hounding me you know yeah. but, so there's that's a great question and it's there's really not an easy answer what you have to really do is you have to build yourself up to where your investors trust you and when you say, okay, boom, guys, I've got this thing open, it's $2 million, and then there people are just jump on it. You know, that's the, that's where you want to get after you've done a few of these things. Yeah. It gets yeah. easier. Uh, okay. You know, our, our first capital raise, I agree with exactly how you you stay. It's stressful, you know, and uh, uh, I think a lot of people don't realize how, how stressful it's going to be. And it's, it's almost impossible on your first syndication to have money in the bank while you're looking for deals, you know, especially on that first syndication. I mean, you really have to have a deal before you can get the money. And it's, it's kind of the chicken and egg scenario, you know, where it's, you know, people aren't going to invest with you until you have a deal and you're not going to have a deal until you have a lot of people who invest with you. So I, I would say on the first deal, you need to have a clear path to raising the money. You know, you're not going to have the money in the bank, but you need to have a clear path to raising the money. You know, Mm -hmm. I have so many investors that I've talked with, you know, they have soft committed a certain amount, you know, Hey, if I have a good deal, will you invest with me? How much, you know? So I have this much in soft commits. I've got the path, a very, very visible path where I can raise $2 million for that first deal. Now I'm going to start looking for properties and purchases that you know i can get with raising two million dollars or less so it's Mm -hmm. it's uh it's difficult it really is on that that first raise but more people you talk to the better an idea you're going to have of how much money do i think i can raise and don't be afraid to ask those specific questions you know if i have a deal like this you know would you invest with me and how much would you be willing to invest type stuff and that way you can kind of start tallying up how much you you think you could get to but and, uh, the, and the biggest thing is to run your analysis and run your performance and run your so that you can say when you get those soft commits hey you know i can if we get this deal i can get you an eight percent return or this you know preferred return um and have it have that three year or five year already, mm-hmm. you know, kind of planned out. So you get those soft commits. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we are okay. about out of time. So, you know, I've saved, save one last question for each of you at the end. And the question, uh, Mike, you go first. How can listeners learn more mm-hmm. about you? Yeah. Uh, find me on LinkedIn under Michael Stoller and also my website, is gateway pe as in private equity mm-hmm. gatewaype.com and right. also the richer geek podcast if you want 
to listen to another podcast. All right. And most people who listen to podcasts usually like other podcasts. So they do. Um, we'll put a link to, to both website, LinkedIn profile, and the Richard Geek podcast in the show notes. So um, Alex, same question for you. Sure. Yeah. If you guys want to reach out to me, you can find me on Facebook at Alex Kingman. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an Instagram account at Alex Kingman as well. Mm -hmm. I'd say those would be the best ways to reach out at this point. That's usually where I'm, I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I mean, it doesn't happen for me often because I spend more, a lot, a lot of time on LinkedIn, but Facebook is actually where we met. So um, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yep. Meet her on Facebook. She, she is there. So um, <laughs> that said, thank you so much to both of you for, for spending time with me today. Uh, very much appreciate the conversation and, and the value added. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community, the Tribe of Titans yet, you are missing out. So get yourself 30 days free by clicking the link below in the description or go to thetribeoftitans.info and we'll see you there.